Hey, you guys. Good morning. It's Friday, 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 Friday. And we're getting the end, getting to, reached the end of the week. I'm very excited to say. Lots of really great questions this week. I'm super excited to unpack for you guys. Um, just an update. We did lose our video director, PJ, this week. Very sorry to see him go. But a uh, number of consequences of that. One is I'm on my own. <laughs> so I'm going to do my best and uh, get this set up for you guys. But um, please understand that it might be a little rough today. So cut me some slack if you can. Um, I'm still going to do everything I can to get to all your questions. All right, with no further ado, we've got some really important ones this week, which I think are the answers, as usual, are going to really be helpful to a lot of us. So let's uh, take some time to unpack what people are saying and what's happening and kind of go from there. And let's start out with this question from Just Interesting. Great uh, handle, by the way. Hello, doctor. Hello, Just Interesting. Here's my experience. No popping sound. Ah, very interesting. Because popping is a classic indication of a tear in a meniscus of the knee. Doesn't hurt while walking, sleeping, or sitting. Okay, uh, sleeping usually is not painful, but sometimes with arthritis, you do get that kind of buildup at night. Walking would imply something going on with the joint, and sitting is generally not that bad. Um, no pain with knee extension or folding. Interesting interesting because that means extension means straightening the knee so the joint moving doesn't hurt pain location uh, while knee is extending c2 pop up beside both kneecap i have pain in the right one on the inner side it really hurts while i'm running ding 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 so uh first of all i'm sorry this is happening to you because you know, here's somebody trying to do the right thing, trying to get out there and be healthy and run. And gosh darn it, once you know, while you're running, you get knee pain. Well, there is actually a name for this. And it's called, I think you have what is called runner's knee. And it's called runner's knee. Yeah, <laughs> because it hurts when you run. It's a very common problem. Runner's knee is the eponym, meaning kind of like what we know it to be called. But it's really a condition, the anatomy of the problem, or what doctors would call the pathophysiology. The problem in your physiology is with the um, patellofemoral ligament. Don't panic. Um, let's unpack that a little bit. So here's a model of the knee, and you're looking at her from the front. This is your kneecap, which you normally can feel even through your pants and under your jeans. You can feel your kneecap. The kneecap is a bone, and on the inside is cartilage. See that blue? And that cartilage is part of a joint between your thigh bone and your kneecap. And the kneecaps, doctors call the patella, and the thigh bone they call the femur. So that's the patellofemoral joint. Why didn't they just call it the knee? Well, it is part of the knee, right? It's one of the things that makes up the knee, but we want to be super specific. And so we call it the patellofemoral joint. Now, the, the bone of the patella is going to be, has got to be connected to the other bones, right? And remember, there's two kinds of tissues that connect stuff in our musculoskeletal, our spine and joint systems. The kind of stuff that connects a bone to another bone is called a ligament. That's a ligament. The patellofemoral ligament connects the kneecap to the, to the, this is actually the patellofemoral ligament, to the thigh bone. This one, this is the tibia, so this would be the patellotibial ligament, which we never really talk about. So anyway, this ligament is, um, is what's inflamed in runner's knee. And the general, you can have arthritis of that joint between the kneecap and the thigh bone. You can have uh, tendonitis of the, the tendons that connect, the, uh, the, of the ligaments that connect the uh, patella to the rest of the body. And that is uh, generally, that kind of complex of problems is called runner's knee. And it's actually one of the most common causes of knee pain. If you lined up 100 people with knee pain, patellofemoral, uh, problems would be 
one of the leading causes along with arthritis. And then some of the least common causes, just because they're so severe and require surgery to fix, are things like anterior cruciate ligament, tears, meniscus, tears or injuries. And as I mentioned before, the big one, the other big one is arthritis. So what do you do about it? Well, first of all, it's not surgical. You're, you're out there uh, running. And I did respond to you in writing, but you know when it flares up, the immediate thing is ice and rest. Um, it's, it's the usual rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation. It's true of almost all the spine and joint injuries. Rest, get off the knee, try not to run anymore until it stops hurting. Ice it uh, as much as you can. Anything from a commercial ice machine with a, a, a brace that goes around and is cooled by water, iced water coming from a pumped out of a cooler. Those kind of commercial units are awesome, but they're expensive. So if you have one, use it. Um, and then there's just regular ice packs and every uh, variation in between. It's all good and it all works. 15 to 20 minutes several times a day is probably good to go. If you want medications, you can consider anti-inflammatory medications for this. Remember, that's Aleve and ibuprofen. The longer you order, or even Tylenol, the longer you take them, the more likely it is they're gonna rot your body. So I don't recommend them for long ongoing issues, like more than a few weeks, but for a week or two, they're, they're pretty safe, depending on your body. If you're not sure, check with your doctor. Physical therapy is a big help with this. Um, oftentimes, there's something going on in the way that you're put together. Maybe you have a little bit of a deformity between the way your thigh bone rests on your leg bone. And a physical therapist there just uh, eagle-eyed to those kinds of things and can suggest changes in function and changes in certain exercises to help you get back to a more stable and better way. Patellar taping is a real interesting one. This is the tape you see the Olympians sometimes wearing. And I, you know, I think this is something that um, a lot of people are interested in. And it's hard to recommend. First of all, I think you got to know what you're doing. So my recommendation would be, if you're interested in patellar taping, get a physical therapist and ask them about it. Um, or even a chiropractor. Ask them if they can do it for you the first couple of times. And see if it helps. If it, if it doesn't uh, hurt, it doesn't hurt, right? So if it helps, great. Orthotics. Uh, sometimes the problem is actually coming from your foot. It's a, it's a deformity. It's the knee is reacting to the next joint, which is the ankle and the foot. So that's worth looking at. That's in that category of, I wouldn't go out and get orthotics to see if it helps your knee. I would talk to the physical therapist first. And if the therapist or the chiropractor recommends it, then orthotics would be something to consider. Surgery is really not an issue here. There's no good surgery for this anyway, as far as I know, and you're not, um, you're out running. So you're not, you know, you're not disabled enough to go through the risk of surgery. Hey, by the way, um, I'm using ChatGPT, the new AI tool, to generate the first draft of the answers. It's right, uh, you know, at least half the stuff that comes out of it, I think, is right. But it does save me a lot of typing, and it's a super cool, uh, super cool aid. So, um, you know, you can use it too. Feel free to open, go to the OpenAI site and open ChatGPT, or the new Bing pretty soon is going to have it. But um, it is really helpful, I think, uh, and really allows me to get you longer and higher quality answers. I don't, you know, on your own, uh, it's definitely something to think about, like Google is, but it's there's a lot of stuff on there that is either not true or maybe not true for you, you know? Like, so it's hard to take it in context. But anyway, it is kind of interesting and a good place to start. All right, next question is from Rome, um, Rome, Kav, Kavkaz, K-A-V-K-A-Z, Kavkaz. Um, hey, hey back. I had surgery a few months ago and I got a bit of meniscus removed. Oh, by the way, this is in response to my video. Is your knee pain coming from an ACL tear or a meniscus injury? How to tell. So Rome had, uh, it sounds, a bit of meniscus removed. That's an operation called meniscectomy. Retore my meniscus partially according to a new MRI. Crap. So now we had a meniscectomy and now we've got a progressive tear. I can still do everything in terms of treadmill, running, wrestling, MMA, right on. You're an MMA, you're doing MMA for fight. Uh, I don't know if this is professional or for exercise, but very cool. But it burns at night with a sharp pain, lots of clicking, popping, et cetera, but no locking. 
Surgeon said we can avoid surgery, but for an athlete, do I need surgery? He told me if I do surgery, he won't be able to repair a slightly torn meniscus and instead would have to shave it. Wow, very interesting. So you've you've got a recurrent meniscal tear after prior meniscectomy, and you're not a candidate, according to a, I, what I hope was a sports medicine orthopedic surgeon, because those are the experts who can really advise you on this. Uh, and by the way, if the surgeon who told you meniscal repair was not an option, was not a sports medicine orthopedic surgeon, that's an orthopedic surgeon who's board certified or specializes and is experienced in sports medicine. That's of the knee and hip, knee and shoulder. So this isn't someone who once in a while is doing joint replacements and fixing broken bones at the hospital and kind of, you know, no, this is an orthopedic surgeon who did a fellowship and specializes in sports medicine. That's the kind, what they do in that fellowship is learn to do and specialize in the uh, arthroscopic surgeries like meniscal repair. So if you were told by one of these uh, surgeons that if they said, no, you're not a candidate for meniscal repair, then you're not. And that means that you only other surgical option is meniscectomy. And so let me translate the question, Rome, as should I have a second meniscectomy? And my answer would be no. Meniscectomy is a surgery, when I look at the data on it, it's, it's very much like discectomy is in spine. There's really not a long-term benefit to the surgery, but it gets you back on your feet short-term. So like you mentioned that you're not having any locking. Well, that's the very best reason to have a meniscectomy is that your knee's locked, you can't walk, and you gotta go get a meniscectomy to get moving again. So you can, I mean, obviously you've gotta be able to walk to do our thing, right? So it takes you from like not walking to walking. It does not take you from walking to walking faster or athletic, or it's not gonna take you from losing your MMA match to winning your MMA match. That's not likely to be the case based on the evidence. So I would tell you, no, you're probably not a good candidate for an additional meniscectomy. And since you're not a candidate for meniscal repair, you're at high risk, 30 to 50% of developing arthritis in the knee and that arthritis is likely to, and one day, if it progresses, you would have to have a knee replacement. Not on the table right now, obviously, you're, you're MMA fighting, so you're not anywhere near that kind of stage. But just so you have kind of a sense of it. Hey, but you know what, Rome? I would not recommend that meniscectomy, but you know what I would recommend for you? Get on an anti-inflammatory diet. A, um, an anti-inflammatory diet is gonna be crucial to reducing that long-term risk as you age of meniscectomy. And it's just healthy as heck right now as you're active and fighting. Uh, proteins aren't inflammatory, so this is gonna be a high-protein, low-carb diet that avoids things that are inflammatory to the body. Check out my site. I have one. I call it the TOAST method, T-O-A-S-T, which uh, involves turmeric, um, oils that are anti-inflammatory like olive oil, not the nasty Crisco, Crisco that like I grew up with. Um, a, you could go through the whole thing. It's a one hour video, but uh, you know, get on an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, and if you wanna go down that road and you're looking to jumpstart that thing and dive in you know, full, full bore, then jump into a, um, an Ayurvedic, a three week Ayurvedic cleanse. I do recommend the Clean, C-L-E-A-N, the book by Ali, Dr. Alejandro Junger. Uh, really awesome and might get you going. No matter what, you're going to feel great. You're going to be better and stronger in the ring, and I wish you the best with that. All right, let's go back to our next question. Uh, oh, by the way, you guys, uh, we're definitely, you know, uh, feel free to chat with me. I, um, I don't see anybody coming in. I hope this chat thing is working. Um, I... Uh, uh, hey, if anybody's listening to this, would, would you please just hit me up with a chat just so I know you're out there? I just want to make sure that I'm getting you, um, but I'm here for you and I would love to respond and I don't see anybody yet. So if you're out there uh, and you can, uh, please feel free to chat with me. All right, um, next question. And this one is from um, Michael Meriday. Uh, this is on my, my video, um, is there a cure for spinal stenosis without surgery? The clinic, episode one. Remember I did that clinic series 
um, that was uh, in the past. I thought it was very cool. Oh, evening, j -Pow. Thank you so much, j -Pow Fettuccini. I appreciate you commenting. I can see that, um, that you're there. And so I know that that uh, chat is working. Thanks so much. If it's evening for you, you must be somebody, you must be somewhere else. Uh, if you can, just hit me up with where you're located. I'd love to see where you're coming from. All right, Mr. Meriday, uh, I can't walk. Uh-oh. Uh, now, more than a block, my legs give out and I fall and I can't get up. Jesus, what are you doing, Michael Meriday? What are you doing, Michael Meriday? I'm getting worried about you, buddy. Um, so spinal stenosis, this was on a spinal stenosis video. Spinal stenosis is a progressive condition. And remember, we've gone over, if you're a regular on this channel, you know what I'm talking about. But if this, this is a model of the spine, and these are the bumps we can all feel in our back. And if I turn it this way, so that we're looking right down the barrel of the spine, this is the spinal canal. From the back of the vertebral body is the floor, to the roof is the lamina. And you don't see because this is a skeleton, but under that lamina is a ligament called the ligamentum flavum, which gets thicker as you get older. So your roof, your ligamentum flavum, and your lamina are coming down. The walls are the facet joints, which are enlarging because look at your knuckles, Michael. I mean, our joints get bigger as we get older, so the walls are coming in, the roof's coming down. Usually there's bulging discs, so the floor is coming up. Combination of all those things is the spinal canal is too narrow. And at first it's a nuisance. It can cause back pain. It can cause claudication, which is pain running down your legs when you walk. But then it gets real, and then it kind of like goes on for a long time. A lot of people are like, oh, do exercises for spinal stenosis. And I mean, that always bothers me so much because we now know from studies that your risk of death, if you don't have a laminectomy to open up your spinal canal, is a third higher so do exercises, they'll kill you, <laughs> right? I mean, now, come on. Uh, exercise can't make a small hole bigger. But in the early, having said that, in the early stages of spinal stenosis, motion is lotion. And so when you move, you do kind of stay active and it does suppress the pain. That's not what we're talking about with Michael. Michael, you can't, you can't walk a block and then you get, you fall and you can't get up. So no, we're talking about this is not motion is lotion time. This is a really serious situation. And yeah, you're really, um, you're really likely to continue to progress and eventually you'll lose control of your bladder. You don't just start peeing on yourself. The way you lose control of your bladder with spinal stenosis is you get to where your brain is not feeling your bladder normally. And so instead of emptying when you're full, peeing when you need to go, you hold it too long. Now your bladder's chronically all the time too big. And when it's too big like that, it, you ever did you ever hold it for too long and then you go pee and you just can't, you feel like you're done, but then you have to go five minutes later. When the bladder is distended and stretched, it gets deformed and then it can't empty all the way. And that big boggy bladder just empties a little bit. So it goes from like 100% full to 90%, 190. So you're peeing all the time. What people notice is not incontinence at first, it's frequency. Frequency, you're peeing too often at too high a frequency. And then what happens eventually is you can't control the bladder again. And you know, if you wait until you're into these bladder dynamics and then you have the laminectomy, you're not likely to get better you're likely to have some permanent underlying bladder damage. And let me tell you, brother, uh, being incontinent of urine stinks. It's just a horrible and very labor intensive. Nobody wants to wear diapers. Nobody wants to cath themselves. That causes urinary tract infections. You think falling is bad? Recurrent UTIs are worse. They kill people like falls. So yeah. come on, man, please get evaluated. I'm, I'm really worried about you, Michael Meriday. So let's get this checked out. Sorry to be such a bummer, but yeah, it's it's scary. Uh, your rec, uh, Piotech 1985 on my should I take glucosamine chondroitin or collagen for a herniated disc? Says you're recommending fusion for a 17 year old boy. Are you serious? Um, first of all, I love your spunk. Uh, definitely, um, definitely uh, excited there. There's our question. Let's go back to me. Um, 
I'm smiling because I, I did a lot of, I'm no longer, I'm a retired doctor because of, I developed essential tremor. I've got too much tremor to be able to operate. But when I did operate, I did a lot of pediatrics. And most of the, the pediatrics is operating on children. Most of the pediatric surgery I did was for brain tumors, for children with uh, tumors of the brain, but a significant amount was also spine. And the idea of operating on a child is shocking. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, you know, a 17 year old is one thing. How about a baby? I mean, I used to have to operate on newborn babies who were born with brain tumors or had problems with their own spinal fluid. And it's just shocking and scary. And I mean, um, not, I mean, for the parents and not, not really for the surgeon, but it's like, um, I get where you're coming from. I 100% get it. But I am serious. There are some conditions for which surgery is the only treatment. In fact, I would argue that when you're getting it properly, if you need surgery, surgery is the only treatment that's likely to be effective. No one's ever like, should I do some exercises or have surgery? No, you do the exercise, right? Should I change my diet or have surgery? No, you would you change your diet. So surgery is what you do when nothing else is going to work. And um, if you happen to be a child, I personally think it's natural to be, are you serious? To be defensive and protective of children. But on the other hand, it's cruel not to give care to people who need it. It's really cruel not to give care to people who need it just because you think you're protecting them. Oh my God, it's the same thing with these homeless, right? I mean, we every day I drive to work now, I see these poor souls, our friends and neighbors who are homeless because we don't have the courage as a community to take care of those in need it, because we, we're protecting their theoretical freedom when they're 85, 90% of them are suffering with really severe mental illness. We've lost our nerve and we're letting them suffer so that we can, out of some vague sense of protecting them. So anyway, a lot of that going around. A very painful issue. We'll talk more about these things as time goes by, but it's definitely something something that's important that I think we should we should look into together. All right, what's next? Uh, total noob fishing. I would love to know what that means. <laughs> total noob. What's a noob, and what's noob fishing? Uh, I like I like uh, fly fishing. I'd love to know more about that. Sadly, the number one mistake, any surgical or semi-surgical intervention. Sadly, the number one mistake is any surgical or semi-surgical intervention. Nobody tells you about arachnoiditis or adhesive arachnoiditis from injections or surgery that pierce the fecal sac and then come to find out your life is over. Iatrogenic conditions are a very real dark secret to spine treatment. Yes, they are. That is 100% true. Um, I wouldn't say any surgical treatment is the mistake, but I would say this. Arachnoiditis is a huge problem, and I really want to thank you, uh, Total Noob Fishing, for bringing it up because it's one of those things. I think people uh, people are often worried with spine surgery, oh, God, I could become paralyzed. And the odds of that are are extremely, extremely low, like on the order of magnitude of being killed in a car driving to the operating room. But um, a higher risk is that, and, and a very, uh, not quite as severe, but very severe one is arachnoiditis. Arachnoiditis used to be very common. And that's because uh, way back in the 70s, before the MRI days, when CT scanning came out, they were injecting dye into the spine that would show up on a CT. But as it turned out, that dye caused inflammation of the nerve roots and arachnoiditis. So that was a huge problem, huge problem. And it, um, it really led to uh, uh, a lot of people with this intractable problem. Another way you can get arachnoiditis is if there's bleeding from the brain down into the spinal canal. I've seen it a lot from that. Another way you can get arachnoiditis is if in spine surgery, they penetrate the spinal canal, cause a dural fistula, and that can certainly lead to scarring and adhesive nerve pain, and it's just horrible. It's very unlikely, but to me, you have to put that in the category of, that's why surgery is last. Along with infection and meningitis, arachnoiditis is a good example of a very rare but very serious condition, and we, you should never take surgery lightly. 
You should always consider it the last stop on the bus. You can't be paralyzed by fear. If you don't, if your life is ruined without it, you need surgery, but you also don't enter into it to just get and feel a little better. You have to understand that there are, as uh, Total Noob Fishing is pointing out, some very re real risks, and those risks are, are things we need to consider. j Pal Fettuccini is in Norway. Ah, that's why it is evening there. Right on, hello, and thank you so much for chiming in. Hey, the rest of you guys, if you got any questions, throw them at me on the chat. I can see you. I'm looking forward to talking to you, and you're what I'm here for. I'm reading these uh, questions that were submitted on the web um, just to try to spread the word, but if you have something uh, that you want to talk about live, that's, I'm here for you, so jump on it. All right, let's see what else we got. Um, Patrick Foon-Chan, very informative. Thank you so much. Um, information is what we're here to provide. Information is power, and I am all about it. So I'm so glad you liked it. It made my day. Um, and then Patrick Foon Chan also said, I thought this lady is in her late 40s or 50s. This is on uh, my video. I've tried everything for my back pain and nothing works, doctor explains. Um, I wish my spine was at least as good as hers at 61. Um, she's a beautiful person, isn't she? It really shows. I'm not surprised. Uh, antidepressant one um, says, in response to, is spinal stenosis serious? The clinic episode one. Serious because I'll need an operation and pay a back surgeon lots of money so he can buy a yacht. Um, well, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it is worth, you know, you always have to notice doctors get paid. No money, no mission. They're not doing this um, for free and they couldn't, right? Unless they were rich. There has to be a way to support no money, no mission. There has to be a way to support the enterprise. Um, you know, uh, a laminectomy is a good example. Um, just to give you a sense of uh, a yacht is a very fancy boat, probably costs, I don't know how much, but certainly on the order of millions and millions. I know a super fancy yacht could be $200 million. I don't know how much you could get a yacht for on the, the lower end, but I'm thinking it's a lot in the millions. Let's say, let's say 5 million at the lowest, maybe 10 million. I have no idea, but Okay, so uh, do you think a spine, how much do you think a spine surgeon makes doing a laminectomy? Um, I actually used to be a spine surgeon, so I can tell you that. The typical spine surgeon um, would be paid about Medicare rates for doing the laminectomy and the Medicare allowable, how much Medicare they set, the government sets the fee for doing the laminectomy surgery would be $1,200. So the surgeon's gonna make $1,200 for doing the operation they got to pay their malpractice. They got to pay their rent. They got to pay their medical assistant in the office. Usually all that stuff adds up to about 50% of the money that they take in. So that 1200 is now 600 Of the $600, the average spine surgeon came out of medical school $400,000 in debt. That's the average these days. And then they trained for an additional, for neurosurgery, it was one year of internship and then six to eight years. So they did an additional nine years of work at the poverty level wages in order to get enough training to be able to do that operation. So for that 600 bucks, they trained for you know, basically 10 years more. I don't know that they're, that's yacht material, bud. I mean, um, I don't, I know a lot of spine surgeons and I don't know one of them that has a yacht. Um, so, you know, I get where you're coming from. They definitely make more money than uh, you and I. Probably, I don't know how much you make, but they're making a lot more than me right now, that's for sure. But I don't, um, I don't think that's a legitimate, um, I, th I think they're, they're actually reasonably paid given the risk and the amount of training and the amount of work that they do. No, just my opinion. Um, you know, uh, you could see it a different way for sure. But I don't think, um, I don't think it's justified to say, I'm not going to pursue care that I need because I think someone else is getting rich on it. That's kind of like biting off your nose to spite your face, right? All right, let's see what else we got. Uh, Roger Morgan says, this guy has good presentation skills. Well, thank you, Mr. Morgan. I appreciate that. What about stem cell treatments for a herniated disc? Uh, this is a great question. 
This is a great, great question. So stem cells are uh, really on the tip of my tongue this week because I did an interview with Dr. Joy Kong, who um, is a stem cell expert in Los Angeles, using stem cells for a variety of conditions. She's using actual cells, whereas I personally am more of an advocate for using growth factors, but she's an expert. She, she really taught me a thing or two about um, how they're being used and reminded me of MHCs, um, uh, which are, um, it doesn't stand for major healing cells, but it should. <laughs> That's kind of like what they are. They're cells that help organize inflammation and get people healing. Their jury is definitely still out on the use of stem cells for herniated discs with sciatica. There's just not any good trials that have been done and you know, they're working on the knee right now. Mayo did a really good trial of stem cell injection for knee pain. And there's been really a lot, a fair amount of information on the knee. The knee is so much more accessible and so much safer to test around with than the, than the spine with the nerves. Things like arachnoiditis, remember that we were talking about before, are definitely a fear so although it could end up that stem cells are actually the treatment for arachnoiditis. So that's, this, that's the conundrum that doctors are in with this stuff. So I would say, uh, what about stem cells for herniated discs? Great question. Jury's still out. I gave you some interesting um, tidbits in my, in my response. If you are um, thinking about this, the doctor who would do it would be either someone like Dr. Joy Kong in Los Angeles. Um, you can look her up, Google that name and look her up on the web or on YouTube. There's also, um, uh, for injections in the spine, pain management doctors in every community, there's one or two who are doing this kind of work. And what you want to do is so Google pain management doctor near me, and then um, call and ask if the doctor does stem cells. And you, you'll usually find one, or often if they don't, they'll say, oh no, but you should try uh, Judy Jones. She's great at it. You know, So get a recommendation and, and try to find the person in your community who's doing it. All right, all right. Uh, Joe Bruin says, PRP was helping me for sure. I was getting an injection every three months for two years at the VA, but they did two erroneous injections. One hit the fat pad. This is in the knee. And uh, I could walk for six months or so. And now it's been over a year since my last injection. I plan on getting stem cells with PRP and Regenix, but now thinking it may be too late. The space between the cartilage and bone is gone. There's a lot of money that I will risk it. I've heard some people get lucky after two to three weeks of total knee replacement. Some are very good at this now. I still think Regenix is the place to go. I disagree. I disagree. I mean, you know, I hear you, Joe, and I know what you're saying, but um, stem cell injections for severe osteoarthritis of the knee buy you time. They do not ultimately change your knee for knee replacement. If x-ray shows your bone on bone, like you mentioned, then stem cells are just going to cheat the clock a little bit. If you're trying to buy a little more time, that's fine, but they're not going to eliminate your need for the procedure. There's no indication of that. And then the other thing I would say, some people don't get lucky with total knee replacement. They do their homework and they get a five-star surgeon. The things that, like, if you read online about total knee replacement, it's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? You'll read about people who are doing just beautifully and flying through and then just these disaster, disaster, disaster. The disasters are predictable. The disasters are happening with people who are not using robotic assistance, going to surgeons that don't do more than 100 or 200 of these types of procedures a year, so they're on the learning curve. They're having surgery in the hospital instead of the ambulatory surgery center. You can control whether you're in the good group or the bad group. And you can control it by watching my videos on total knee replacement and selecting a surgeon who can help you get to the get to that good result. It's definitely doable, and it's definitely something that you should consider because it's important, and it's really gonna it re, it's really gonna make a difference. All right, um, let's do one more. I'm afraid we're running out of time, but I'd like to take one more of your questions. Let me just check the chat. Ah, Mr. Fettuccini. Oh, Mr. Aman YT809. Hello, sir. Hello back. Thank you very much for your comment. Mr. Fettuccini, I heard a talk where some doctor mentioned stem cells can't survive in the disc space because of the pH value. Uh, I'm not a doctor, but I'm just replying. And the um, 
I believe you're exactly right. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. Let me just give you my history. And if you watch when my interview with Dr. Kong comes out, you'll see this. But I started out, my very first job, I was a scientist for the National Institutes of Health here in Bethesda. So I worked for the federal government. And I ran a lab. After two years, I got the nod. I was, appointed, I was promoted and I was the lab director of a lab that called the CNS Implantation Unit. And what we did was implant cells and looked at their potential, stem cells, for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. And what we found out was none of the cells we were implanting survived. They all died. It was the death of the cells and the release of the growth factors that had the therapeutic effect. I personally am strongly biased that when I, that the stem cells, so why would they live in the disc where they didn't live in the brain? I, I mean, to me, I don't have any evidence, no one does, but to me, it's very likely that the growth factors that are released when the cells die are gonna end up being the thing that does the gives you the benefit. And so I just don't see any point of, okay, if they wanna take cells from fetal blood and inject those cells and they all die and release their growth factors, great. But the idea of like having a bone marrow, having your own bone marrow tapped so that they can get your cells and grow them up. To me, that's not the way to go right now. So I, I think that that's definitely it. Uh, so I got a question. I can't, the name is in a different uh, alphabet, but the question is total hip replacement cost. How much does total hip replacement cost? That's a great question. If you're looking to pay cash, if you do not have health insurance, then you should look to spend about $20,000 US. You might be able to get it for 18, you might, it might cost you as much as 22, but think about $20,000 US as the cost of the procedure. If you have health insurance, then you have to pay your deductible. So look on your card, your deductible, you have to pay 100% of that. And then you have to pay your co-insurance, which is usually most plans are 80-20. So insurance pays 80% after the deductible up to the, co the out-of-pocket max. Let's say your out-of-pocket max is 10,000 and your deductible is 2,000. You gotta pay the 2,000 to get to your deductible, then 20% of the 800, which would be another 200. So that's 2,200. And then insurance covers the rest. Uh, if you're not an accountant or a mathematician and you don't know what the out-of-pocket max, the allowable, the deductible, and all this other crud is, uh, I mean, it's just confusing as heck. It takes me months and years to train people on how to do this stuff. So I, I don't know how we expect you guys to do it. Um, anyway, the, the thing to do is just call Phoenix Spine and Joint. Uh, that's a, a website, phoenixspineandjoint.com, or you can call, call them at 602-256-2525. There's uh, uh, operators standing by. They'll go over your situation, run you through a checklist to make sure you're a candidate for total hip replacement, and then set you up and tell you what your out-of-pocket cost would be, whether you have insurance or you're paying cash or whatever it is. So that's, uh, that's the answer to that. Uh, Jay Fettuccini says, time. I, are you saying what time is it here? It's 1043 in the morning here in Phoenix. Are you saying how much time does it take to do a total hip replacement? That's 100 minutes. Average is 100 minutes, 110 minutes. Um, so I'm not sure. Maybe you could clarify. Next question is from JJ. I'm having a little hernia. Should tell me, having a little hernia should tell me I should not stretch my back. I've just stretched a little much and now it's a little sciatic pain. It worsened my uh, slight sciatic sensations. No, you should not stretch if you have uh, sciatica due to a herniated disc. So remember, the disc is uh, normally has this hard outer part called the annulus. And if you have a herniated disc, this model doesn't have one, but if you have a herniated disc, that means the annulus has torn and the nucleus, the soft part, is trying to herniate out but JJ, the, if you bent too much, you could squeeze more of that soft part out. In fact, if you wanted to cause yourself to have a disc herniation, and brother, you do not, right? I mean, it's crazy. But like, my point is, the opposite is true. You could cause a disc herniation on purpose by bending. So you got to be really, really careful with your bend. On the other hand, 
You don't want to be inactive. So this is like typical doctor advice, right? Uh, be active, but not too much. <laughs> but that's what it is. So you need to be active, but not too much. And I think the way to think of it is do light activities that don't have impact. Like I wouldn't want you to go out jogging with your herniated disc, but I want you to stay active so you could run on an elliptical, right? Because your, your feet are on the pedals and they never hit the ground. Um, I wouldn't want you to lift heavy weights in squat and deadlift, but you could swim because the gravity's out with the water and you're getting good relief. So, you know, be cautious, but don't, don't bend and stretch, but do stay active and keep those muscles moving and, and keep it going. Jeff Fettuccini, oh no, did you see the bigger message above? No, I didn't. Um, oh, I have a case. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I've got it right here. Um, by the way, I sent a case through the page with the imaging, et cetera. Okay, I'll get on that. Um, I'll have that for you next Friday. Thank you so much. I think the person you mentioned had left was one who replied saying it would be in today's episode. Think you will get to it later. Yes, I will get to it later. I'm so sorry. I lost my director of the show this week, and um, he's a documentary filmmaker and is, you know, he's an artist and needs to do needs to do different things. Respect him and appreciate the time he spent with me, but. Um, I will uh, get, to, I, I, I need to get into that software. I will do it live and get the response to you. I'm sorry, at the latest next Friday. I'll try to get to it early next week. I have multi-level bulges and herniations, L3 to S1. What's the best placement for a steroid shot? Um, so steroid epidural injections can be done two ways. Interlaminar, where the spreads out and goes to multiple levels, or transforaminal, where it comes from the side and goes to one level. If you have a single radiculopathy, transforaminal is the best way to go. So single radiculopathy, transforaminal. So if you have sciatica in one distribution, on the outside of your foot, that's L5-S1, to your big toe, that's L4-5, to your inner thigh, that's L3-4. If you have one of those, get a transforaminal block. If you have uh, wanted to treat diffusely, then the interlaminar epidural would be the way to go. But interlaminar epidurals really don't work for that kind of pain. So I would say interlaminar epidural is probably not ever indicated. I mean, I never say never, but not often indicated anymore. It's also much more likely to give you a CSF for them to cause a dural tear with the needle and then need a blood patch. And that's how you get the arachnoiditis that we talked about earlier. So, you know, it's a big old mess. Uh, Fettuccini, understand and appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for your understanding. What a gracious, gracious soul you are. I appreciate that. All right, well, I'm about out of time today, you guys. Thank you so much for all your comments. I'm really looking forward to getting up live next week. Um, really looking for people to come on the show live starting next week. If you're able to come on and we can lock you in on video, I'll put you in a waiting room and then I'll pull you in so we can talk and go over your imaging and get it all up. Uh, my new assistant, Phoebe, is going to be working with you to get you on the show. Um, have a great week. Be good, be kind, be safe, take care of yourselves. It was really nice talking to you today, and I look forward to talking to you, seeing you soon. Have a great weekend, and from best practice, I'm Dr. Dan Lieberman.